Welcome everyone, thank you for coming and uh, I think this is week five of the series of eight, time goes very quickly, very unusual circumstances and um, if there is a fire alarm or some sort of alarm system, please don't go that way, follow me this way and we'll go into the yard down the stairs here, so if there is. And so today we're pleased that we've got our own curator Lindsay Bavin speaking. I missed this morning, I usually attend both, but this morning I was on, a, on another Zoom meeting. Zoom, which I'm getting rather fed up with. Um, so I'm glad to be here this afternoon to listen to it for the first time. And the topic is Sausage Saints, Wizards and Witches. A talk by Lindsay Bavin, museum curator. So Lindsay, over to you. Okay, thank you all for coming today. Um, yes, as I said, my name is Lindsay Bavin and I'm the museum curator here at Truge Yard Fish Folk Museum. I'm a fan of weird history and I'm very fortunate that uh, Kindling has plenty of it. So we will kick off with the first part of my talk title, The Sausage Saint. So, yeah. Sorry, do we need the light? Um, <coughs> Can everybody see? Otherwise, um, I can turn the light off. It's just because it's shining. Well okay, well. Paul, would you mind just flicking that light switch behind you? Sorry. No oh. problem. Oh. Fantastic. Okay, are you alright? No, I can't see because you're right. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> okay. You're right in front of everything. Interesting. Okay, right. Anybody watching at home, I'm going to disappear, but hopefully you can still see all of this. <laughs> <laughs> right, can you see now? So, the legend tells that there used to be a statue in King's Lynn Minster of St Thorlac, who is an Icelandic saint. Right, what was an Icelandic saint doing in King's Lynn, you might ask? Well, King's Lynn has ties to Iceland <coughs> through the Hanseatic League and a little incident called the Anglo-Hanseatic Sea War, which began over tax evasion, kidnapping and a possible murder. But that's a story for another time. Well, who was Thorlac? Thorlach is the patron saint of Iceland and a fisherman, and we're fortunate to have an account of his life in the Thorlach saga. He was born 1133 in Iceland, but around 1160 studied canon law in England, specifically in Lincoln, which is not too far over the border from us. And he describes both his French, he was educated in Paris, and also English education, where he acquired a great amount of learning and thereby benefited both himself and others. Although exceptionally well educated, there were a few references in the saga that his speech was hard and slow and he was hyper fixated with writing. There has been suggestions by historians that Horlack may have been on the autism spectrum. And there is a recent movement to add to his repertoire, also make him the patron saint of autism. Anyway, Thorlach must have recommended his English education to his nephew Thar, uh, who went to study in Lincoln and was described as surpassing all other men in Iceland in courtliness and learning the making of verse and book law. Thar would go on to succeed Thorlach as Bishop of Skarholt after Thorlach died in 1193. And at the 1198 Parliament, it was funny enough his nephew who suggested that he should become a saint, <laughs> but he was not recognised by the uh, Catholic Church formally until 1984. So it took a little wee while, but <laughs> he got there in the end. <laughs> so after Thorlach's death, there were several miracles reported, a miraculous recovery from severe burn from a woman who fell into a boiling hot spring, saving a chieftain from exsanguination in the bath, and resuscitating a drowned boy. But perhaps the oddest miracle was the one that took place in Lynn. Now, according to the Thorlac saga, there was a man named Aaron living in England in a place called Kim, which we think probably due to um, different alphabet and everything is Lynn, which Lynn would have been known at that time. Um, well, specifically Bishop's Lynn, but we won't quibble. Um, but this was the person who had the statue of St Thorlac made and set up in what is believed to be St Margaret's Church. So, there's a lovely picture of it. So, 
story goes that one day an English cleric came to the church and saw the statue and asked whose its likeness was of, and he was told it was St Thorlac, a bishop from Iceland, at which he burst out laughing. He went into the kitchen and got a bit of sausage and came back in front of the statue. He held out the sausage to the icon and called it Morlandi. Now that is a derogatory name. Of... Apologies for anybody from Iceland who I am probably butchering these pronunciations, but apparently that means lard eater and was so named for their love of sausages. So, want a bit of sausage, man? You're a sausage bishop, was apparently what the cleric said. Said while he was waving this sausage in front of this statue. However, when he tried to leave, he found to his horror that he could not move from the spot. He was locked in place. He couldn't even drop the sausage from <laughs> as his hand locked tightly around it. So, people gathered to witness the miracle of the frozen cleric with the sausage in his hand. And eventually, the uh, cleric confessed his offence, uh, repented of it and um, asked the people to pray for him. And after a time, he was freed from his miraculous frozen state and uh, had a lot more respect, I presume, for St Thorlac. <laughs> By the way, if anyone would like to celebrate this unusual saint, Thorlac Mass is celebrated on the date of his death, which was the 23rd of December. In Iceland, it is actually considered the last day of the preparations for Christmas. And therefore, St Thorlac's day, the house is cleaned and the preparations for the Christmas meal are begun. As the patron saint of fishermen, it's also customary to eat cured steak and um, along with boiled or mashed potatoes accompanied by a shot of brunivin, which I assume is probably a very strong <laughs> liqueur. But uh, right, so while we are on the subject of saints um, and St Margaret specifically, uh, there was another miracle that took place. And there's also another movement to make this person a saint of gossip victims, and that is local lass Marjorie Kempton. Now, sadly, no drawings of Marjorie survive or engravings, um, and in fact, one that is commonly used for her, I've found on uh, web pages, is not her at all. It's actually Julian of Norwich, um, which you can see her her book on Divine Love. <laughs> so, definitely not Marjorie. This one here um, is from our children's book um, about Marjorie Kemp and her life, which was a project that we started last year to bring um, the story of Marjorie Kemp to local school children. And thanks to uh, funding, we were able to deliver. We're actually still in the process of delivering because of COVID, but um, to year fives in the town, um, preschool, so they can learn all about this person. In fact, both Julian of Norwich and Marjorie Kemp are worthy of full talks, so I'll try not to go into too much detail, but um, yes, both fascinating figures. Marjorie in particular, autobiography is the first in the English language, and though as mentioned, um, she is venerated, especially in America today, at the time she was actually put on trial for heresy and nearly burned at the stake or barrel for what to modern ears sounds like the most bizarre of reasons. Um, she liked to talk about Jesus a lot, and she wore white, which some people here today are wearing white. Um, this is all to do with the Lollard Heresy Trials, and if you'd like more information about the Lollard Heresy Trial, I thoroughly recommend popping downstairs, and not, obviously not now, <laughs> <laughs> and looking at our exhibition Weird History, which has a panel all about it. But anyway, and also Marjorie, funnily enough. So, the Trinity Guildhall, now the Town Hall, on Saturday Marketplace, went up in flames and sparks threatened St Margaret's Church. Marjorie called out to God to send some rain down or some other weather to quench this fire and it began to snow. I should point out that this miracle took place on the 23rd of January, <laughs> 1421. Um, here's an artistic interpretation. <laughs> so. There are other miracles of Marjorie's which are harder to explain, including a miraculous escape from harm. She was praying in St Margaret's and stone and a beam from the ceiling fell onto her head and she was crushed. And apparently she cried out to Jesus and her pain was gone and she was unharmed. And the other one was, well, the priest who was writing down Marjorie's story had poor eyesight and found the early draft that was written, we think possibly by Marjorie's son, um, very difficult to read, the handwriting was apparently atrocious and it was in a mixture of English and German 
which would make sense if it was my first son. Um, and he's finding it so impossible to read that Marjorie decided to pray to God and apparently the priest miraculously found it easier to read. However, his eyesight was failing, so Marjorie prayed again and his sight was restored. So I think that's the saint portion of my talk neatly covered. I will say, I do get very excited about history and that causes me to talk faster and faster and faster. If at any point I am <laughs> going at a firing pace, please just give me a wave, I'll, I'll slow down. And if anybody at the back is having any trouble hearing me, also just wave, I'll talk a bit louder. Okay, cool. Right, so to the next part, wizards, <laughs> as you can see. Exhibit A, pointy hat. Exhibit B, large beard. Exhibit C, staff. That's the, the full Gandalf there. Anyway, this story relates to one of the more unusual buildings in King's Lynn, the Exorcist House. And an unusual story, well, lots of more information that I'm going to give can actually be found in Alison Gifford's book, Ghosts and Legends, which I would thoroughly recommend reading. And we do have a couple of copies in our shop. <laughs> Sorry, shameless plug. <laughs> anyway, one of the house's many occupants over its period of time was author and radio personality Frederick Frank Robert Buckley, whose stories of murder and mayhem were eagerly awaited by his radio listeners. In fact, he had basically like a murder mystery show where you had to call in and guess the killer. So I think that would be something that would be quite entertaining today, to be honest. But um, yes, that was his thing. But um, you might be wondering, none of the above makes him sound like a wizard. Well, there's a strange story related to Professor Eric Talbot, who was tasked with the King's Inn Archaeological Survey in 1963. He regularly walked around with two cameras ready to photograph any points of interest. One evening he found, much to his annoyance, that he couldn't take a picture of the exorcist's house. The shutters on both cameras kept jamming, and eventually Mr Buckley came out of his home and informed Mr Talbot that he uh, was a wizard, and that he would continue to prevent him from photographing his home. Although apparently the conversation seemed to have turned the course and actually became more positive because Mr Buckley invited him in to show him his collection of the occult and inform Eric that he was an expert on black magic and liaised with the local constabulary. So one of the stories that we have that features in Alison's book from a police officer was about Frank's paintings, because Frank was also a amateur artist. What astonished him was that the paintings always looked as if they'd just been painted, they were very very fresh looking. Um, the paint was always bright and indeed it's one of the pictures seemed to glow in the dark. Um, when people inquired about how he had accomplished this, um, he said his secret was it's my own recipe for a medium which I mix the paint in and apparently the instructions included when asked he took down an old book and in it contained many old, old spices and oils and when brewing it on the stove apparently it made a pretty unpleasant smell uh, one of frank's paintings was called the tramp in the woods and the picture showed an dangling blade with an old peddler's pack on a tree stump it was duly exhibited at an exhibition at the fermoy gallery and received great praise in fact an art collector wanted to buy the painting and apparently remarked, it's the tramp, he really sets the whole scene off. So either, you know, well apparently the artist said, but I haven't painted the tramp in it, that's the whole point of it. And the art collector obviously rushed over and said, he's gone. And um, just as the painter intended, only the pack was visible. So either the art collector didn't look closely enough, or he's got magic paintings. <laughs> anyway, that is not the end of the oddity that is the exorcist house. After a long illness, Frank died, and his widow decided to sell on and go back to her Native America. Now, Mr. Arthur West has admired the cottages for many years and was delighted to actually finally be able to buy it when it was auctioned in 1976. However, his plans changed, he remarried, and the property lay empty. Now, his two stepdaughters moved down from Corby and on their regular walks around the town noticed that the lights were on inside the cottages. And here is the description. One day, Dillian and Sally West rushed home. Who's that lady living in your cottage? They asked their father. Mr. West was puzzled as he got squatters. The girls described the intruder. She sat by the fire with a cat in her lap. She had grey hair in a bun and wore her glasses halfway down her nose. Mr. West was amazed from the description because it was exactly like that of Mrs. Buckley's. 
Her favourite spot was beside the fire with her cat. Neither Gillian nor Sally had ever seen Mrs Buckley in their entire lives. Stranger still was when he called on Mrs Buckley's daughter to find out that Mrs Buckley had supposedly passed away on that day when the daughters were supposed to see her in the cottage. So that's a, a bit of a mystery. Now, that is the Exorcist hat. You've probably all seen it if you've been to the local area, but um, for those of you who haven't, if you go down to St Nicholas Chapel and then go into the chapel yard and down the side, it sounds rather grim, but there's a load of gravestones. If you follow those, you'll find the cottage. And it's, that's what it looks like from the side, and that is the uh, end of the layer of gravestones. So yeah, beautiful old little building. Right, so, from one mysterious happenstance to another. Now, I do not suggest for a second that the following are wizards, but an air of magic and mystery still surrounds the Rackley Spring though it has long since fell to ruins. A secret royalist society formed around the spring in 1650. Their number was strictly limited to 30, based on a Cromwellian edict which banned assembly of more than 30 men for fear of rebellion. Things haven't really changed that much, have they? <laughs> anyway. So, the Rusty Brotherhood moved from a political group to a social gathering. As time would progress, the men would drink a secret punch made from spring water, meat, eat with beef joints, saddle of mutton and lobster salad, and then smoke a secret blend of tobacco in the clay pipes that the members were all presented with. Now there is a funny story connected to this. A few years back, the museum received a donation of items, um, I think from a relative of a former member of the Rusty Brotherhood, and apparently within the donation was the recipe for the secret punch. Now, there was a lot of excitement this end, as you can imagine, and secret recipe is handed over a punch, that's definitely enough down our alley. Um, However, obviously, this was of great concern to the members of the Rectory Brotherhood. What were we going to do with the recipe? Did we intend to publish it? Was there going to be True Giard Rectory Springs secret punch in our gift shop? Um, well, no, because the punch recipe that had been donated wasn't the secret recipe at all. We had it checked by a member of the Brotherhood. So, oh well, perhaps one day we will release True Giard not so secret punch. <laughs> Anyway, going back to the subject matter, you're probably still wondering why I included this on the section of Wizards. Well, in an interview in the Lynn News recorded in 1985 with a Mr. Dorney, the magical properties of the spring were discussed. The spring had certain properties which appeared to take out the alcoholic effect of the brandy. I think we got through half a bottle of brandy each, but over a long period. People talk very fluently and constantly but they are perfectly capable of carrying on normal behaviour. No one ever needed assistance to stay at home. I have never in any way felt embarrassed after drinking, and you have no hangover the next day. So there we go. Magic water, which, uh, yeah. And if you'd like to know more about the Rectory Spring, there's two excellent books by Andrew Clapham, um, which go into much greater detail, especially about its musical history, which I've completely glossed over. Um, but the things which are of interest to me are it's got some, well, had some unique inscriptions. Now, one which was on the obelisk of the Rekli Temple. We dedicate this sacred fountain of happiness, these waters of joy to Bacchus and Venus and the gods of this place. Whoever upholds this column or gives order that it be upheld, may he live longer than anyone else in his generation. If you wish to relinquish your load of care, go to whatever place is full of pleasure. Let this be your labor, let this be your care. Let us all go, both little and big, we wish that Venus and Bacchus shall love us. That's quite a nice one. Um, Venus, obviously, is the Roman goddess of love, and Bacchus, the god of wine, which I suppose links to the former magical properties. Um, interestingly, there is another inscription from 1789, which is a curse, and that was inscribed in the building, warning vandals that they would die the last of their line if they defaced the building. It all sounds very kind of, you know, Tutankhamun. <laughs> Death will come on swift wings to whoever opens the sarcophagus. But uh, sadly, the curse obviously didn't happen um, because it's when the Temple Meads estate was being built in the 1980s, the building works unfortunately disrupted the water flow to the spring and it dried up. So let us move on to the last and largest section of this talk witches and you'll have to forgive me i could not resist <laughs> if anybody's staring that wondering what is that it's from monty python and the holy grail <laughs> it's the famous witch scene where um they dictate that if a witch weighs the same amount as a duck then she must be made of wood and therefore can be burnt <laughs> so 
Pay for that one. Right, now, before we go into the more famous witch hunts of the 1600s, we're going to look at the perhaps lesser known medieval and Tudor witch hunts. Now, in to go way back into 1487, uh, the Malleus Maleficarum, or Hammer of Witches, was published, written by a German Dominican monk who was called Heinrich Kramer. It was a treatise to argue the existence of witches working for the devil, and the text served as a manual for witch hunting, torturing, and killing those found guilty. I should point out that the text was written after Kramer was expelled from Innsbruck, where he tried to hold an inquisition and had accused seven women of witchcraft. They were all three or fate minor penance. One of these women accused was Helena Schuberin, who Kramer was reportedly obsessed with to the point of insanity. That was the uh, description by um, what was his name? Bishop Carl Golfer, who had thrown Kramer out. And he returned to Cologne, obviously a bit miffed, and wrote the treaties and sent it off to the Pope and was promptly given the seal of the papal bull so he could once again resume his witch hunts. Now, there was quite a few what we might consider today quite ridiculous signs that you were a witch in the 1500s. They varied from being female, being old, being young, being poor, being rich, having arguments or disagreements with others, being a healer, infertile, or if your neighbours were having trouble concealing, if you exhibit odd behaviour, have a birthmark, or if you've broken every rule of the Bible. Now, if anyone's wondering, there's 613 rules in the Bible, so you'd have to be very busy. Anyway, the Tudors took a keen and enthusiastic interest in soothsaying, or the art of prophecy. The tradition itself has ancient uh, origins. The Oracle of Delphi, inhaling oleander vapours, revealed divine prophecy to the Harrospects of ancient Rome who foretold the future by licking at entrails. Perhaps the most famous ones are auguries who chart the future by looking at the flights of birds. Now, in Tudor England, there was an oracle by the name of Elizabeth Barton, who went by the nun of Kent. Initially, she was not a nun, but a domestic servant. Her first prophecy, prophecy rather, in 1525, when Barton was 19, was about a child dying in the household where she worked, which came true. In, by 1528, Elizabeth was introduced to Henry VIII by Cardinal Wolsey, his right-hand man and religious advisor. By that point, Barton had become a nun and her story had spread, spread well beyond Kent. Her prophecies aligned with the king's interest at the time and she briefly enjoyed his patronage, which she only really actually met him twice, but I suppose at that time his patronage was not killing him. <laughs> However, <laughs> Barton's hallowed status as a gifted prophet soon turned against her when she prophesied that Henry would die within a few months if he married Anne Boleyn. Not surprising since Barton was a staunch Catholic. However, not a great move. Henry's agents rebranded her as the Mad Maid of Kent and spread that her prophecies were false and that she was a sexual deviant. Remember this, because it's going to come again rather soon for another famous woman. Now, Barton was found guilty not of witchcraft, but of treason. An act of Parliament meant her punishment was authorised without trial. Just aged just 28, Barton was hanged, as you can see from this engraving, at Tyburn on the 20th of April 1534, along with five of her supporters from the clergy. Her head was removed and placed on a spike on London Bridge, and it's believed that she was the only woman in history to have that particular dishonour. So she really made him mad. <laughs> Why such a severe punishment for a nun? Well, around the time of Barton's predicted Henry demise, there was a famous case of poisoning. In the case of a Lambeth cook accused of serving poison gruel to two people in a botched attempt to assassinate the Bishop of Rochester. Henry VIII, paranoid about being poisoned himself, forced through the act of poisoning. The act changed the punishment for the crime of poisoning to being boiled alive. There's only three instances of this punishment being carried out, two in Smithfield and the other in King's Lynn. It's referenced in Mark Alexander Haunted Inns and the Chronicles of the Grave Rise that a maid was boiled alive in 1531 in King's Lynn for poisoning her mistress. It is difficult to prove the quarter sessions records that the town hall only survived from 1620 and the only jail delivery roll records from 1545, and it's not the type of thing that would get mentioned in the whole books. There is a reference in, well, there's a legend in Lynn that the maiden's head pub does not refer to the Virgin Queen or Norfolk slang for skate, 
but to this boiled maid of Lynn. However, not to be confused with the maid's head on Tuesday marketplace, because that wasn't founded until 1736. Anyway, all of that is laying the groundwork. <laughs> or Henry VIII being frightened of profits and poison. So we arrive to 1536 and Boleyn has not produced a male heir and Henry is on the hunt for a new wife. After all the trouble his first divorce and marriage to Anne caused, there was a need for a convenient reason to justify getting rid of her without a protracted divorce. The story sold was that Anne Boleyn was an adulteress and witch who had used magic to seduce him. Boleyn was castigated as a sorceress and like Elizabeth Bart and the rumour mill began to spread that Anne was a sexual deviant. However, the rumour of Anne having an extra finger, which would have perhaps been firm proof in the 1500s uh, that she was indeed a witch, um, is actually a later fabrication by a Catholic propagandist, Nicholas Sander, who started the rumour a few decades after the Lynn's death, which still lingers actually to this day. Many people believe that it's on green sleeves, it's down to that she was wearing long sleeves to cover up her arms. Um, but in fact, Boleyn's skeleton was exhumed in the 19th century and she had exactly the same amount. She did have an extra fingernail, but not an extra finger. Um, he also added um, that she had a projecting tooth under her upper lip and she had an unsightly cyst on her throat, which she'd wear elaborate jewellery to cover up. In the end, Anne was executed on the grounds of treason and not witchcraft. However, her sentence at the time was being burnt at the stake, which in an act of kindness was commuted to a simple beheading and as a nice well, little aside he changed it from being an axe to being a sword which was the traditional means for a nobility so at least she got a little bit of dignity at the end which unfortunately Barton did not um, however the rumour mill which had surrounded Anne's beheading had resulted in a growing belief in malevolent supernatural forces in T Tudor England in the 1540s Henry the eighth went as far to pass an act against it, making witchcraft punishable by death. This act was repealed a few years later by his son, um, but further acts were passed in 1563 under Elizabeth and 1604 under James I. These acts helped reinforce accusations of sorcery against anyone unfortunate who found themselves facing enemies who <coughs> wanted a convenient reason to get rid of them. It may surprise you, though, that although James is more famed for his persecution of witches, it is in fact when witch trials took place under Elizabeth I than in the entirety of the 17th century. 270 witch trials under Elizabeth and 204 for the 17th century. It's remarkable that Elizabeth herself was interested in the occult through Dr. John Dee. I believe there was a... Um, BBC Four documentary on him recently. Go have a watch. Um, he was a mathematician, antiquary, and astrologer who was also heavily involved in numerology, magic, and the occult. Letters from G to Her Majesty would be signed 007, which the famous author Ian Fleming would later borrow. D was also believed to be the inspiration for Shakespeare's Prospero. D gave advice to Elizabeth I, including making a forecast for her coronation date. She believed in his magical powers and he was a trusted counsellor. There's a lot of, this is actually a later painting, it's not contemporary to the time, but it's believed to have been adapted that um, around this the painting was altered and there was actually a ring of skulls. But uh, yeah, just, I suppose I probably should have put him in the wizard section to be honest. <laughs> anyway, many articles at the time in Tudor um, make the point that many of the accused were old women who were poor and lived by themselves. One example that we have in King's Lynn is Mother Gabley, who was accused of witchcraft and was believed to have caused the death of 13 people, including Robert Archer, Oliver Cobb, William Barrett and Richard Dye. The World Thanks to Sea Parish Register says, deaths were brought to pass by the detestable workings of a rascible witch of King's Lynn, whose name was Mother Gabley, by the boiling or rather laboring of certain eggs in a pail full of cold water. I have no idea what irascible means. I can't find it in a dictionary. Um, and but it doesn't sound good. Anyway, the evidence of against Mother Gabriel is that she'd been seen magically boiling eggs in cold water and through sympathetic magic, stirring vigorously to raise a storm at sea. And that was enough to convict her. She was hanged as a witch in 1583. And there she is. 
supposedly boiling eggs and causing all these flavors. So we move on to perhaps the most famous legend in Lane, the witch's heart. Now, it's located above a window, I believe 17 Tuesday Marketplace, although I might have seen, might be 16. Um, however, there seems to be different cases for who the actual witch, to, to whom said heart belongs to. Now, one candidate is Margaret Reed, accused of witchcraft in 1590. According to Henry Hillen in his history of the Borough of King Lynn, her punishment was to be burnt. Helen also refers to Elizabeth Housegood, who also suffered the same punishment later in 1598. Looking at the archives, Margaret Reed was indeed an actual person, and there were two Margaret Reeds actually living in the town at the time, as found in St Margaret's Parish Register. One was baptised on the 25th of March 1568, so it would have been around 22 uh, in 1590. And the other candidate was Margaret Hammond, who married a Thomas Reed in, at St Margaret's Church on April the 8th, 1562. So logically, she would have been around 48, 50. The only other clue we have is a brief reference to an Agnes Shipwell, who supposedly was a witch who died at age 27, but I have yet to find in any records of a witch called Agnes Shipwell. Anyway. There is one rather lurid account of Margaret's activities, which featured in an article in the EDP back in 2007. All right. Margaret seemed to have the ability of being able to make things happen. Questions soon piled up over how she had enough money to support herself, why the spider lay in the corner of her window, why evil smoke billowed out of her chimney. She'd become the centre of gossip. Her premonitions of pain and death soon occurred. This aroused suspicion that she was a witch. She was tried with ducking and having seemingly floated, condemned for witchcraft and was soon burned to death. So looking at that, her proof that she was a witch was that she had a spider in her house, smoke coming out of her chimney, somehow that she had money to support herself and that um, that was enough. Oh, and she could doggy paddle. And that was enough to uh, burn her as a witch. Now the story goes, while the flames scorched away, uh, it is said that her heart burst from her chest and smashed into the spot above the window, which is now marked with a diamond. And then, it's not done, it fell to the ground and bounced its way along towards the river ooze, where it sank underneath with the water bubbling and roaring as it was enveloped. Now, the other candidate is Mary Smith, who was condemned in 1616. Her story was recorded by Alexander Roberts, a preacher of the time. Mary was the wife of a glove maker, and rather harshly, Robert describes her as simple-minded, becoming full of indignation at her neighbours, and one night the devil visited her, promising her power if she renounced God. Seemingly, Mary took him up on his offer, and the first victim of this power was sailor Joan, or John, Orkton, who had apparently struck Mary's son. She cursed him and that his fingers and toes would shrivel and rot off, and his fingers is indeed uh, shriveled up and had to be amputated. Next, the widow Elizabeth Hancock, who Mary believed had stolen her hen. Witnesses say Elizabeth was cursed with a mysterious illness and was seen levitating above her bed. After two more incidents, because those weren't enough, Mary was hauled off for jail for witchcraft. According to Robert, praying and seeking forgiveness, and a crowd around her sang psalms. Mary was hanged on the 11th of January 1616. And at the moment of her death, her heart leapt out of her body and came to lie under the spot where mysterious forces had carved a heart within a diamond upon the high wall. Now this could suggest that the heart was already there, and this was the second incident of a flying heart. I should point out that Mary Smith was trying to the reign of James I, not Elizabeth, which initially brings us on to the witch trials and James I. Now, as mentioned, James I passed an act in 1604 that made almost all forms of witchcraft punishable by death. In 1597, seven years before taking the throne, James had written a book on witchcraft, demonology, which, when he became king, he quickly enacted the new law. However, conviction rates for witchcraft actually went down under James, likely because of one of the other things the law did was outlaw the use of torture to get a confession. Now, we do know there was exceptions to this rule, and the perfect example of this is the witch finder himself, 
Matthew Hopkins. Matthew had been summoned to Lynn by old Miss Thomas Revett on the 11th of May, 1646, to seek out witches. Now, do a little background to our Witchfinder General here. He began his career in Manantry in Essex, and at the time when the average worker's daily pay was about two pence, he was paid £23 to cleanse the town of Chelmsford of evil. Now, for 14 terrifying months, he ran amok throughout East Anglia at considerable profit to himself, clearing towns of witches. And indeed, when he was invited to King's Lynn to do just that, he was to be paid the princely sum of £15. Now, the people which find a general accused were Lydia Brown, Grace White, and Dorothy Lee, Dorothy Floyd, Thomas Dempster, and Cecily Taylor, Dorothy Griffin, Thomasine Parker, Catherine Banks, and Emma Godfrey. Now, of those accused, only three, Grace Wright, Dorothy Floyd, and Dorothy Lee, would be convicted and hanged, for which Hopkins received a bonus of another five pounds. So, how did he get around the no torture rule? Well, he utilised old methods and new methods to find witches, what we now call sleep deprivation and waterboarding. He asked when it was that the witch first communicated with the devil. One of his techniques was to use a pricker to test whether um, marks on body, scars, um, or even nipples were immune to pain. And as he reputed, um, apparently this three inch spike would be plunged into the victim. Uh, and they, if they were a witch, they would feel no pain and no blood would be drawn, um, which would be proof that they were a witch. Now a more likely explanation is the device was rigged. <laughs> much like a stage prop, but, um, but perhaps the most famous method is the ducking stool, which was actually a Saxon invention, which had been previously called the cucking stool, and was a punishment for scolds. The trial of Lydia Brown was postponed, as she was unsurprisingly given Hopkins' methods, not of sound mind. It's believed that um, nearly 200 people um, were victims of Matthew Hopkins and suffered these tortures. Now, a legend arose in the 19th century based on the account of William Andrews, a writer on Essex folklore, that Hopkins himself was accused of being a witch. Andrews asserts that Hopkins was charged with stealing a book containing a list of all the witches in England, which he reportedly obtained by means of sorcery. Hopkins declared his innocence, but an angry crowd forced him to undergo his own swimming trial. Some accounts say he drowned, while others say he floated and was condemned and hanged. However, no records of any trial exist. And in 1684, John Stern wrote his own book, A Confirmation and Discovery of Witchcraft. In it, he revealed that Hopkins had died in 1647 peacefully after a long illness of consumption. Church burial records show that Hopkins did indeed die on this date. So, unfortunately, he did not get his just dessert, but uh, that was the end of the witch finder general. Now, the last witch to be burned in the British Isles was Janet Horne in 1727, who had the misfortune of showing signs of senility, and her daughter had a deformity of the hands which earned her the cruel nickname the Devil's Pony. Just to provide some temporal context, 1727 is the same year Sir Robert Walpole of King's Lynn became Prime Minister, George II was crowned and Sir Isaac Newton died. I should add her daughter luckily escaped, although she was also convicted merely on the fact that she had deformed hands. Um, this did not mean burning her the punishment was over, as we know in 1731, Mary Taylor was burned in Tuesday Marketplace. Mary Taylor often gets grouped in with the Kingsley witches, but in fact her crime was she was guilty of petty treason. Anne Wright, landlady of the Queen's Head, which I believe was on London Road, um, was murdered. Mary Taylor was a servant there and reportedly admitted into the inn um, of George Smith. Now Mary was found guilty of petty treason. Petty treason is betraying your employer. Um, treason obviously betraying your monarch or country. Um, and for this crime she was burned. Now George, who had actually committed the murder, was simply hanged. Their motive apparently um, and Wright had promised Mary a fortune upon her death. However, George wasn't willing to wait that long and decided to speed up the process, which uh, didn't end well for either of them. Now, 
It might surprise you that although the last burning was in 1727, the last witch to be convicted in England was 1944. Victoria Helen Duncan, a Scotswoman who travelled the country holding seances with one of Britain's best known mediums, reputedly numbering Winston Churchill and George VI amongst her clientele. She was arrested in January 1944 by two naval officers at a seance in Portsmouth. The military authorities declared were preparing for D-Day landings and in a heightened state of paranoia were alarmed by reports that she had disclosed, allegedly via contacts with the spirit world, the two sinking, or sinking of two British battleships long before it became public knowledge. The most serious disclosure came when she told the parents of a missing sailor that his ship HMS Barn had sunk. It was true but the news of the, of the tragedy had been suppressed to preserve morale. Desperate to silence the apparent lack of state secrets, the authorities charged Mrs Duncan with conspiracy, fraud and with witchcraft under an act dating back to 1735, the first such charge in over a century. At the trial, only the black magic allegation stuck and she was jailed for nine months at Holloway Women's Prison in North London. Churchill, then Prime Minister, visited her in prison and denounced her conviction as tomfoolery. In 1951, he repealed the 200-year-old act, but her conviction stood. Her granddaughter, Mrs. Martin, recalls the news of Mrs. Duncan's conviction spreading through her working-class suburb of Craig Miller in Edinburgh like a virus. It was in all the papers, and of course, the evil eye, which has spawned, you name it, we recalled it. My older sister, Helen, just wouldn't mention it. She shut it out of her mind. It was grim. I was only 11 years old and children can be the cruelest under the sun. They taught us how to look after ourselves. I can tell you that much. The rest was silly, really. If they'd spoken to her, she would have stopped giving seances until the war was over. Let's be honest, she had two sons in the Navy and one in the RAF and my father in the Army. So why would she turn around and put the country at risk? A petition was set up by an arts festival in 2007 and the holder of the medieval barony in the coastal town of Preston Pans, East Edinburgh, a few miles from his mum's home, um, actually used his age and power as the local baron to pardon 81 men and women from the area executed for witchcraft in the 16th and 17th centuries. He said, the prosecution and conviction of Helen Duncan as a witch was clearly as much of an injustice as those of the 16th and 17th century, he said. It's hardly credible that a 20th century court would be prepared to convict someone of witchcraft within living memory of many in this present government, as well as the deprivation suffered by Helen Duncan in prison. The effect of the stigma on her family was and remains considerable. Now, her granddaughter, Mrs. Martin, and supporters faced a battle to convince the Home Office to act. Now, at the same time, convicted witches across the US were being pardoned, I say convicted, we're talking about the Salem witch trials and that sort of time frame. Um, Mrs. Duncan sadly died in 1956, three months after being arrested again in a police raid on a seance in Nottingham. Now, paranormal investigator denounced her as a fraud who used cheesecloth, rubber gloves and egg whites to create extraplasm that she claimed to produce. Um, but her granddaughter and sister, her grandmother was a genuine spiritualist and an ordinary woman with a gift. She said in an article, I just want her name cleared. She was never given a chance to defend herself at the trial. It was such an injustice. While all this was happening, our troops were preparing for D-Day. Why did they spend 10 days trying to convict an old lady for witchcraft? As a result of the case, the Witchcraft Act were finally repealed, as mentioned in 1951. A formal act of parliament three years later officially recognised spiritualism as a religion. So, what have we learnt? I appreciate the supernatural elements need to be taken with a pinch of salt, no pun intended. These stories give insight in the societal fears at these points in history. Henry feared the poisoner, understandably, as he'd upended a thousand years of Catholicism, made enemies both literally and figuratively at home and abroad. And interestingly, funnily enough, the word witchcraft in ancient Greek is pharmakia, which is also the word for poison and medicine, and from where we get the modern word pharmacy. Understandable given that the line between medicine and poison can be at times be quite thin. Warfarin, for example, is a common blood thinner, but it's also one of the prin principal ingredients in rat poison. So, two famous witches of Greek mythology are Circe and Medea. The former used potions to turn men into animals, and the latter created potions to help Jason win the Golden Fleece. Just for information about how the word poisoner 
and witchcraft may have eventually got a bit muddled. And uh, with the last story of Helen Duncan, it is clear they feared spies and simply used witchcraft as a means to convict. Not that dissimilar to Matthew Hopkins and the scores of unfortunate women and men convicted on the evidence that they could dolly paddle. So that is my talk on sausage saints, wizards and witches. Thank you. If you enjoyed it and would like to know more about it, I recommend going to see our latest exhibition downstairs, um, which goes into greater depth on things like the Lollard Heresy Trials, Marjorie Kemp, and the Graveyard Ships. And thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Are there any questions? Um, I, Iceland is interesting. I've forgotten about um, before that. Um, I didn't know there was a statue in St Mark's Church. Yes, seemingly. Oh, I wonder what happened to it. I imagine in the Reformation it probably got smashed oh, yes, quite it probably got smashed up in the Reformation, <laughs> rather than being transported back to Iceland. Lynn does have a lot of links with Iceland, as you know, and there's some people in Lynn now who are Icelandic, and uh, I went with one of them to Iceland um, a couple of years ago, and um, all they want to do, all his relatives, they all want to live in King's Lynn. Do you know why? Because of weather spoons, they couldn't believe it when they visit them. They, in Iceland, it's very difficult to get a drink, and when you can, it's very expensive. When you can get it, it's not very good. They couldn't believe sitting in weather spoons, spoons eating, drinking all that cheap lard. <laughs> they all want to come and live in Lynn. Um, and um, the um, Refrey Brother. Now that was very interesting to me because I am a member of the Refrey Brother. And um, yes, even I don't know the recipe. The chief brewer is a chap, a well-known Lynn chap, and the deputy brewer, who we know very well at True Shard, um, they won't reveal what the recipe no, is. No, they don't tell us what it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so the Refugee Brotherhood still exists, but we don't meet at the temple anymore, and that's all been shattered. As you talked, I think you mentioned that. It's, we now meet in, when we do meet, we don't meet very often, in, Thors, in Thorsby College. And the Exorcist House down here, have you been inside the, the Exorcist No, I'd love to see the inside. Yeah, you know, well, I can take you, and a friend of mine lives there, he's an art dealer, and it's a very atmospheric place. You know, the ceilings are not very high. He, it's just full of art, Dexter's and Baines and everything else, because he did, you know, his name is uh, Batch Koskus. He's one of the first Lithuanians to come to Lynn. He's known as Batch. Um, and he deals in art, so that's all very interesting. With the Witch's Heart, we all know that building, I think it's always thought to be 1616, isn't it? Mary Smith one, but I didn't know, because it says in the, the pamphlet, it's in the public library. The original, uh, one of the printed editions is still with us. And it says her heart burst from her body and planted itself into the house of her accuser, which was this chap called Roberts. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it deplanted and bounced down to the River Rose. That's, <laughs> that's quite interesting. I have to remember that on the next down tour. Did you know that, Edith? Do you tell that story in your trips around? Not that one about the bouncing to the river, no. no. <laughs> there was uh, one query I was going to ask. Um, hang on. Mary Smith, uh, George Mary Smith, Taylor. Mary Taylor. Mm -hmm. Mary Taylor. Yes. Um, I understood that um, she had become uh, a lover to George Smith and they were from the Queen's Head in High Street. High Street? Which oh. is now, it, it, well, it was a game shop. Because the other Queen's one on London Road is the Queen's Arms. Ah, the so Queen's I Head, think it was the Arms. High Street. Ah, right, because. Um, I did wonder because I couldn't find a High Street one. I could only find the London Road one. But if it, they'd written the name down wrong and it was the head and not the arms, that mm. makes perfect sense. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it, 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 was, it, was, it was in High Street. Unfortunately, demolished in 1960, where that is next door to that new restaurant. Is it yeah. Pocahontas or something? Oh, that one. It's, it's an empty shop. It's an awful build, modern building. It was there. Yeah. And in the Second World War, because all my family contacts. It was the favourite pub in Lynn of all the American forces from Skullford. Right. Yeah, and they ran out of money by the late evening and they used to leave their, they used to take off their <laughs> watches and rings. And a, 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 yeah, a cousin of mine called Eddie Sibbles used to run, I'm much older than me, he's dead now. And apparently he'd pull these drawers up and just packed with watches and rings <laughs> and American jewellery. And then and they have to pay, they, then they got ta the taxi drivers in Lynn made a fortune taking all these Americans back to Skullford before the military police got. The military police used to oh, go yeah. looking for them. And they also, also drank in huge numbers at the Globe. 
at yeah. what's now Weatherspoons. Um, Teddy Boys versus Yanks, you know, in the fifties, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So Lynn, is, as Lindsay has described, a lot of interesting history. And next week, just before I thank people, um, there's a link with Skullthorpe, um, a good friend of Trujard, and I talked with him. He was a colleague at the college for a long time. His name is Peter Gunn. I think we sell downstairs one or two of his books. It's called Skullthorpe Airfield in the Cold War which means the 1950s and 60s, it should be very interesting. I don't know if you wear Skullthorpe, that's where the American fly planes, uh, spy planes flew over the Soviet Union. You know, Gary Powell's a famous incident shot down in 1961. Gary Powell's was shot down in the Soviet Union. It all came from Skullthorpe. So that should be very, very interesting. It was the biggest USAF base in the United Kingdom, by far, over 20,000 Americans. Um, they couldn't all live on the base, some lived in Lynn because there wasn't enough room. So that's next week, some of you will be booked up for that, no doubt. Donations, we're still looking for any loose change in your pockets. And we need a microphone <laughs> um, you, Well, you've heard about all these things. We are doing the museum through Lindsay's hard work. We've, um, you know, we, we, um, we've, we've got some grants to help us through the winter, but we still need a few loose coins to buy things we need, mainly cameras and microphones and things to spread the word and facilitate our online stuff as well during the while the epidemic lasts. So anything there will be greatly received. Thank you for coming and supporting us. It's very much appreciated. And um, and uh, Lindsay, thanks to Lindsay, she's she's very busy. So thanks, Lindsay, for finding the time to put this talk together. Um, very interesting. I didn't know. I, I hadn't got a, a clue about sausages and saints, but now I have, um, and and all the other stuff. Very interesting, and um, linking up with Lynn's very rich scenes of history, which you've helped to highlight. So, Lindsay, uh, thank you very much.